what I'm sort of tasked with is to try to get um, get, get you a little more sense of how to manage these pesky little volunteer teams that you've now committed to. And so, or how to be a good volunteer on these pesky teams that you're part of. And so, part of what we're going to do today is we're going to do a little activity. I, I'm in the organizational behavior group at Stanford, and, and it's completely impossible for me to give a lecture. Okay, so it's just one of, I can't do that. So, we're going to have some activity, and then we're going to talk about it. Um, and so, what I'd like to do. Is I'm going to do a brief introduction to what we're going to be talking about today, then do a little short activity with these colored sheets of paper that have um, appeared on your in front of you, and then we're going to do a larger activity which is designed to. And many of you may have even done the activity before. In fact, I hope that many of you have done the activity before because we're going to do a little bit different twist on it. How many of you have done? Uh, a desert survival, lost at sea, lost at. All right, perfect. This is great. All right, so we have lots of experts in the room. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do it, but, but, but so just do it, and we're going to do it exactly as you've done it before, except one of the cool things about exercises is the debrief can take lots of different directions. We're going to take a, we, I expect that we will take a different direction from what you did when you did the. Um, you're lost at sea, lost in the desert, lost in the moon, whatever, uh, exercise, okay? Because I think it's, because, and, and, and by the way, what we're going to be debriefing is real consistent with the research that I do. So I'm actually very um, interested and committed to this sort of topic. So come on in and give her a colored sheet of paper. <laughs> so, but don't look. So one of the things, you know, we put people together in teams for a variety of reasons. We put people together in teams for political reasons. We want to make sure all our bases are covered. I'm not going to really talk about the political reasons. Here, let me help you with that. I'm, it's over here. You may want to go that way. I'm not going to talk about the political reasons. I'm going to talk about more performance reasons of the team, about why we put people on teams. We put people on teams because, first, many hands make light the work. Okay, so if we have lots of people on our teams, I, as an individual, don't have to do everything. And that's actually a real benefit for teams. We also put people on teams because many eyes looking at the same problem may see something very different. And in fact, we can look at teams as having really two different components. The component of implementation and the component of innovation, creativity. And the types of teams and the process of those teams, how those teams function, are very different because their tasks are very different. And so what we're going to focus on here is sort of first, why would we have teams? And that's going to be a pretty quick because, of course, we're pretty much, all of us are pretty committed that we all really know why we have teams, right? Because it turns out that actually teams are better, do better on average than individuals. So that's great. So we want to take advantage of that. But they do better in lots of different ways. And partially the reason they do better is because not all of us have exactly the same view of the world. And so when we look at a, a stimulus, what we see is very different. In fact, there are lots of, of creativity um, researchers and practitioners who argue that we never actually create anything new. What we do is we put things together in different ways that haven't been put together in that way before. And that really is what the majority of us do when we engage in creative activities. So it's not necessarily, you know, creating something out of a new, sort of a new whole cloth, but rather taking pieces of what we know from one set of expertise and applying it to others. And in many respects, as you do your consulting teams, this is exactly what you're doing. You're taking the expertise that you have and applying it to perhaps a new or an interesting twist to a problem that you may not have seen before, or you may have seen aspects of, or in fact, you, you, you're simply not going to implement. You're going to actually create and innovate. So first thing I want to do is, is give us an, a, a little impetus as to why and, and the power of teams. And the first place, the first way I want to do that is I actually want you to put your hands on the colored paper, but don't turn it over yet. <laughs> so I want you to have it in front of you. All right. Now, when I ask you to turn it over, I'm going to ask you to do a very simple task. I want you to count the number of Fs, you know, the, the letter F, in the sentence that is in that paper. 
Okay? And, but I'm only, only to let you do it for a very short period of time. So I'm going to ask you to turn over, count the number of Fs, and then I'm going to ask you to turn it back over. When I ready? Set. Turn it over and count. Stop. Turn it back over. Okay. Let me just ask a question here. A couple of questions. How many people How many people saw 1F? Raise your hand. Okay? 0. How many people saw 2Fs? Raise your hand. Be, don't be proud. Don't be afraid. 1, 2, 3, 4. This group over here saw 2Fs. Four, that was four, not two, Maggie. Try that again. <laughs> what happens when you get old is you can't multitask. It's really hard. How many people saw three Fs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. How many people saw four Fs? One, two, three. How many people saw five Fs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. How many people saw 6 Fs? Anybody see more than 6 Fs? 6 Sigmas? <laughs> no. Nope. Okay, so we'll just we'll give it a... All right. Now, I want you to look at it again and do the same thing. Count how many Fs you see. Ready? Go. Turn it over. Okay, now let's try again. How many people saw 1F? Okay, still nobody. Two? Uh-oh. <laughs> three? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Four Fs. One, two, three, four. Five Fs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay. Just in case you were wondering, I want to remind you, this is what we're looking for. Okay? <laughs> right? This is you got this is what you're looking for. You, There's uppercase Yes. Uppercase as well. Or this. <laughs> Only at Stanford would that question be asked. <laughs> Now what I want you to do is I actually want you to do a little buzz group. And so, unfortunately, the room's not really very set up for it, but find somebody that's, that's close to you. And actually, I want you to do a little group discussion. And Ursula, you've got to find somebody. Maybe, maybe Lisa back there behind you. But I want you to take a few minutes and count how many Fs. Ready? Or a few seconds. So find your colleagues and go. So where are they? All right, that's enough. <coughs> Hello, stop time. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. I see there's been some ahas in the room. All right, let's just check. Hey, you guys, let's try now. How many see three Fs? How many see four Fs? Five Fs? Six Fs. Okay. Now, the question I have is, what, why did, I mean, look at these numbers, right? I mean, there are, you know, 24 people and 19, it didn't drop down that quickly, right, who were looking, by the way, the colored paper differences, they mean nothing. It was just, a, because if you've all had organizational behavior, you know that you have to, you can't trust me, right? So, you know, I, I did that to sort of say, well, to justify the answers, because you see, if you had different colors of paper, you thought, well, maybe there's something different about the papers, and that's why we see the difference. But no, it's not that. It's you, right? 
<laughs> it's your fault this time. So let's think about this. Why is it that we got so much variation in what is, by the way, an objective task? There's nothing, there's nothing subjective about this, right? How many F's are in this sentence? So what, why is it that people only ended up with two? When you got two, what were you looking at? First the first letters, right? Finished files. What else? Why? And then you got another one, right? The next most common was to get scientific. And very few of you, actually relatively, were, what did you miss? You missed one of. You got one, but you missed one. That's real interesting. Okay. Why do you think... <laughs> she had the right dynamic, she just didn't push it all the way through. Why do you think you missed the ofs? <laughs> I think when we read words like that, it's almost like we process them unconsciously. Mm -hmm. You don't register that word. Your eyes just fly. So your eyes fly over is one possibility. It's a tiny little word. Yeah, John? It has a V sound. It has a V sound. So when you say it to yourself, finished files are the result of years of scientific. Oh, well, there's another one, effort. Or at work. I used to say effort, but now it's work. Okay, work. Right? So what happens is when you say it out loud, it doesn't code as a... It closes a V, right? So there's a difference. But of course, what happens is immediately once people got together and looked at it, it was clear, you know, I saw a lot of people going, oh no, that was what it was, <laughs> right? And so part of, you know, so this is a very, what we call a very conservative test because this is not subjective. This is not something new. This is very clearly, can you simply pick out the Fs in this sentence. Simple task, right? <laughs> and yet, what we see was, yeah, the answer is no, um, <laughs> but what we see is that getting together in team actually gave you a different way of looking at the same objective data. And so that's part of what teams do. They allow us to really sort of get, re I mean, we have, a, we have a focus, and that focus, that expectation, that theory that we hold drives our interpretation of data. And so what happens is we find ourselves sort of being blinded by our theories. In this case, you know, looking for the sound of f rather than v, right? You know, ah, oh, the f sound, whatever it is. And so what happens is we find ourselves being blinded by that. And so bringing other team members who have other competing theories, right, is important. So, but it's really twofold. You, in order to be an effective team, you've got to first have the difference of perspective. But then you've got to be able to get it raised to the level of awareness of the team. Right? And it turns out that both of those are very hard tasks to do. First, to make sure you've got the necessary variety on your team. And secondly, to be able to actually use that variety, right? to have it come out into the, into the team space, the, the intellectual space of the team. So what we're going to do is talk about those two issues in the context of desert survival. So actually, why don't you just these are all exactly alike. Okay. Ah, not just, just completely exactly alike. I know. Now they're all the same color. Now you question. <laughs> okay, we don't really know. And let me just sort of go through this because you have all, most of you have done a variant of this. Here, let me have a couple down the front row here. Sort of you guys get lost here in this. Um, <laughs> but as a group, you could. <laughs> Hello, Vivian, how are you? So this is just the exact exercise you've done before, but turn to the third, I think it's the last page, whatever that page is, I think it's the second page. And what you see is a is what we're going to be doing first individually and then as our team. Here, I'll take the extras. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, as you can read on the front page, basically what's happened is it's 10 a.m. It's the desert. It's the Sonoran Desert. The Sonoran Desert is the high desert in Arizona, just to give an example. Um, and 
your plane has crashed. You're 70 miles south, southwest of a mining camp, the nearest known habitation, and you're 65 miles off the course, your visual flight course, the VFR course that your pilot put into play. Uh, unfortunately, the pilot and the co-pilot are both dead. The only people left are your team members. And in fact, what we'd like to do is when we actually begin the exercise, if I would like you to get into groups as much as you can of your actual intact teams. Okay, so if, you, if, if there are five of you in your team or there are three of you, we'll basically take three from one team and two from another and put them together. But we'd like you to get into your teams. And basically with groups of about um, five people each, right? There's no more than five. Or, is there any team that's more than five here? American Red Cross has five, I think. It's five today. That's, the yeah. that's five? Okay, then teams of five or that's the, there are about 30 people here, so you should have about six teams of five. Those of you who are on your own, Stevenson House or Cardiac, you know, if you could just get together so there's about five people, I think it should work. Okay. <laughs> now, it turns out that it's going to be very hot today. <clears throat> 110, which means about 125 on the desert floor. It's, you know, 135 on the desert floor. It's pretty hot. Um, you basically didn't plan on crashing, so what you have in your pockets is $2.83 in change, $85 in bills, a pack of cigarettes, one of you is a smoker, and a ballpoint pen. Now, um, before the plane caught fire and burned to just its little kind of, you know, skeleton, uh, you were able to pull 15 <laughs> items out. Go to the second page, and you'll see those 15 items. Now, the first task we're going to do is the individual rankings of these items. So what I'd like you to do is to rate 1 to 15, 1 being the most important to 15 being the least important, these 15 items. That would, should probably take you less than 10 minutes. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get together in these five-person teams, and we're going to sort of sit in Arbuckle, Upper and Lower, we're going to do, one team will stay in here because you're going to be videotaped. You know, so I think the Red Cross team should stay. The Red Cross, since you are the intact team, you guys get to stay. Hey, we'll have a video of your behavior. We, if, we, if you lie to us, we can go back and look, right? Then, huh? On the website. Oh, good. Okay, then what we do is, as a team, come to a, an agreement of how these 15 items should be rated. That should take another 20 minutes. So pretty much what we're looking at is by about 10.30 or 10.40 to reconvene, let, let me be more precise, by 10.40, reconvene back in here with your lists, at which point we will then talk about what you did and how you might do it better. In terms of these two conditions, right, Bringing in difference of perspectives and getting those perspectives heard. Okay? Any questions? All right. So take a few minutes. Go 1 through 15 and rank the items. 1 being most important to 15 being least important. All right. Now, take out your sheets of paper because I have the expert. Now, let me give you this, the, the credentials of our expert. He's a survival expert who contributed on the basis of, uh, to the item rankings. He's the chief of the desert branch of the Arctic Desert and Tropic Information Center for the Air Force University at Maxwell Air Force Base. He wrote two books, of, among many, one called Survival and the Other Peoples of the Desert. And he's actually really old because during World War II, he spent much of his time working with Allied forces on the Sahara on desert survival problems. He's dead now, okay? Pretty much. But here's what he said. Since we didn't add any technology to your experiences, number one, cosmetic mirror. Oh, of all the items, the mirror is absolutely critical. It is the most powerful tool you have for communicating your presence. In sunlight, a simple mirror can generate five to seven million candle power of light. Okay, the reflected sunbeam can be seen beyond the horizon. If you have no other items, you would still be better off than an 80% with an 80% chance of being spotted and picked up within the first 24 hours. So, oh, you're gonna, you're not going to like the second one either. Assuming you're searching. Yes. If nobody cares, you're dead. Okay, that's it. Number two, top coat. 
Once you have a communication system to tell people where you are, you need to slow down your dehydration. And so 40% of the body moisture is lost through dehydration, is lost through respiration and perspiration. So you want to keep that environment around you as moist as possible to, to stop, to slow down the, the evaporation. Number three, the water. Okay. You could probably survive three days without, with just the first two items, just to give you a... Number four, the flashlight. The only quick, reliable night signaling device that you have. With the mirror and the flashlight, you have 24-hour signaling capability. The parachute is number five, red and white, as a shelter and a signaling device. Number six, the jackknife. It's help helpful for rigging the shelter and cutting into the tough barrel cactus for moisture. Yes. Yes. Number seven, the plastic raincoat. It turns out that this is you can make a solar still with this. Yes. You can use it to get water in the desert in the evening. There is moisture, and you can get it to, to basically condense. It could also be useful. Um, it turns out that the physical activity required to extract the water is likely to use up about twice as much body water as gain. But, you know, it'll give you something to do while you're waiting. <laughs> right? Number eight, the pistol. <laughs> you think it's, no, it's not for food gathering or killing each other for food gathering. <laughs> By the end of the second day, speech will be seriously impaired and you might be unable to walk. The pistol will be useful as a sound signaling device and the bullets as a quick fire starter. Number nine. After two days, a Stanford Business School student speech is in there. <laughs> you know, it gives us all hope, doesn't it? <laughs> this guy never came here. <laughs> Number nine, a pair of sunglasses. The intense sunlight of the desert. Photophthalmia. <laughs> Number ten, the compressed gauze kit with gauze. It's not really so useful as... Uh, to, you know, wrap up wounds because the desert's actually a very uh, clean environment. But it could be used as rope for wrapping legs or ankles and face to protect against dehydration and sunlight. So it's more like a mummy wrap as opposed to a protection wrap. Number 11, the magnetic compass. Aside from the possibility of using its reflective services as, as the signaling device, the compass is very, is useless. Why? In fact, it's dangerous because it entices you to think you can walk out. Oh, yes. Sectional air map, useful for starting a fire. <laughs> or for toilet paper. Which one? <laughs> Number 12 is the sectional map. Number 13, the book entitled Edible Animals of the Desert. The group is concerned about dehydration, not starvation. Uh, it can be used, it might contain... <laughs> General rule of thumb, if you have lots of water, eat, otherwise don't, okay? Number 14, two quarts of vodka. While severe alcoholism kills someone, they usually die of dehydration, <laughs> or when severe alcoholism, wa alcohol absorbs water, so don't use it. The bottle might be helpful, um, you know, you could use it in terms of uh, helping to start the fire as a temporary co coolant for your body. And last but not least... And I love because the American Red Cross team has two physicians in it. And they said, absolutely, number two. By the way, this is from, let me get this down. Oh, I am because I heard it. <laughs> from the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. If you walk in the desert, here's what you need to know. <laughs> number 15, salt tablets. Oh, my <laughs> I know. I knew I had to get some legitimacy up here because both physicians said, salt tablets, number two. <laughs> number 15. I'm going to lose my license. <laughs> All right. So now what I want you to do as a team, I want you to get the, make sure the team is for, is for reliability. Tell me what your team score is, which is you want to subtract your, the number you said for an item 
by the number the expert said, and it's an absolute number. I don't care about minuses or pluses. You're not going to get that benefit. So just give me the absolute number in, into that third column. Between, between, you want to do, yeah, so we want to do two of them. You want to take, the, you want to do number, step four. Difference between one and three, which tells you how good you are. And then step five, difference between two and three, how good your team is. And I want your team, I want you to make sure that the number is correct. Oh, you know what I hate? Here's what I hate. I was just telling urban e ecology this outside. Sometimes you have these great uh, exercises, and then they just go awry. <laughs> and so the point I'm going to make is really going to be hard to make with this group, with the possible exception of GMS. Where an example where, t where the worst is the individuals and the best is team. Exactly. But I'm making but but I'm going to make another point. That wasn't the point. <laughs> That's the general point. Yes. Hey, let me tell you the general point which you guys showed, you know, sort of in lights. And that is you are mu well with with possible exception of one team. <laughs> <laughs> that was recorded. Yeah. You guys were better as individuals than you are as a team. <laughs> Everybody else, right? From 1 to 15, it's no one. Yeah. <laughs> it's that salt tablet thing. It's salt <laughs> oh, let me tell you. It was, Joseph, you were there, right? You were in this team. Joe said, I don't agree with that salt. And the two physicians turned and said, well, we're physicians. And he said... I give. So, <laughs> no, here's the problem, right? Now, what's interesting, you have a name tag. Give me your name oh, tag. Oh, no, I'm not showing my name tag. <laughs> this physician said, I could be wrong, but I think it's salt. And the other physician said, salt. And so they all capitulated. It's like, okay, we're going with the expertise. Okay. So, barring that, Here's the other thing we don't see, except in this team, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, so I'm going to, you know, is that the best individual was better than the team, right? And it turns out, by the way, if these were normal teams with normal people, <laughs> we would see that, that pattern a lot, okay? So but this, is, this is really interesting. And I think part of the problem is, so many of you have done this before, is you think you're experts, <laughs> and you drag the team in very weird ways, right? Sort of like the expert okay, positions. Going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about this a little bit and try not to mention too many names. So were they actually being videoed, or that was just a... This to me, you know, that would be interesting. What a great experiment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't argue as much as they're like, oh, I want No, they were, what was interesting is they were very polite. Yes, they were very polite, very polite. And they were also very rational. How about this? May I, may I build on that comment, please? You know, that's what they did. And so that was sort of... <laughs> we had a hand up, yeah. Is there a cutout for, like, life versus death? Yeah. How many of you walked out? How many of you walked out? You're dead. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do it. I had this group, I, I heard them, this is not their fault. I heard them say, we can do 20 miles a night. In what alternate universe can you drive through the desert 20 miles the in a Boy night? <laughs> <laughs> but they had salt tablets, so they were okay. Well, look at the shape he's in. I know. Well, let's put it this way. Some individuals who are highly skilled highly, you know, sort of physically fit might be able to walk out. But let me tell you, the average reasonably fit person can't do that. And certainly not for two nights. Right? Think about this. You know, you guys, I know, it's tough getting old, but we got to kind of acknowledge these things. You know, it's like, well, when I was 16, I could have done that. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, t what we want to talk about and I'm going to talk about it anyway, regardless of what, what you guys did or not, because this first part was fun anyway, is first synergy, which you did have, and that is that the individuals didn't do, on average, did not do as well as the teams, right? And in many respects, that really is the first component, right? That's the first component of any reason why we bring teams together, because we get this huge advantage of synergy, right? That people coming together raise issues, 
that would not have otherwise, that you might not have thought about as an individual. And so whenever there's a situation where you don't really know the answer, then teams can provide a huge resource to you. Now, secondly, so the benefit, the big benefit of teams is synergy. The big cost of teams is process loss. And we didn't actually see much process loss here. Um, but the process loss would be replicated here as where the individual, where at least one individual, or typically, typically one and sometimes more, do better than the team does. And that's a real loss because what happens is you have, you have one member of the team who, by themselves, seems to have been hurt by the interaction. And what I want to focus on, because the, to the topic, um, or at least the title, as you can sort of see, is getting your voice heard. And part of what makes us more effective as teams is that we take advantage of the potential that exists within the teams. And the question is, how are we able to do that? How can we actually accomplish that? <clears throat> There actually, just a second. There it is. I knew there was one here. All right. Go back now. Well, process loss is the inability of groups to take advantage of the of the intelligence, the intellectual property that exists within their teams, and process loss comes from a lot of different things. Now, I want to talk a little bit about these four compare these four conditions. Uh, they obviously did not occur here, so let's just talk about them hypothetically, because in these groups they didn't happen, but they do happen. Uh, one is, well, we did see actually expertise, right? Expertise, you know, sometimes expertise is real, and sometimes people like expertise is, there's expertise out there, but it doesn't really apply to the problem, right? And so, so you can get distracted. See, I'm looking up now. You can look distracted from that expertise. Let me, let me, one of those interesting studies, a college, uh, actually, my student did. I have a doctoral student who's now on the faculty at Kellogg. And she did a, a very interesting study using this exercise. And what she did was she put, ran the exercise and then looked at teams in their performance when a male was the most expert member and a female was the most expert member. Oh, yeah. Now, notice, that as, as you saw here, you didn't know who the most expert member was. The team didn't know, right, until after the fact, right? So now, what did she find? Did she find any difference in performance of those two groups? Yeah, of course. I wouldn't be mentioning it, would I, Ron, otherwise? No, no difference. Okay, move on. I know. We're gonna... So what happened? When the expert, most expert member was male, the teams did better. Oh, I know. Beth, you were going, thinking I was going the other way, didn't you? <laughs> oh, Ron, you did too, huh? No, it turns out the males. That, well, there's two, no, there's two hypotheses. From that, from that study, you cannot disentangle the two alternative explanations. One is the females who are more expert spoke and nobody listened or they didn't speak. They self-censored. It's probably a combination, right? Because now, of course, she has to do the second study to find out which it was. But <laughs> I can tell you from my experience in teams, it's probably a combination. First, people say, this is not a task that I'm a particular expert in. So the things I think are kind of silly, maybe I won't even bring them up, right? Or I bring them up and people say, excuse me, were you a Boy Scout? <laughs> Did you ever do this stuff, right? No. So part of it is that you get a sense, right, of contribution is really a function of people's expectations about people's quality of contribution, independent of necessarily the objective quality of that contribution. And so part of this is, as a team leader, what I've got to be very sensitive to is I may see these kind of patterns developing where certain people are put into boxes and those boxes don't allow them either to contribute or allow their contributions to be actually way overweighted, right? So I, this is, I mean, it's a very hard task because you re never really know how well you're doing until the end, right, in this kind of process. Also what happens is people's, this is, and this, this sort of gender and expertise and expectations and assumptions all kind of go together, but coalitions may form, right? Did you find in these teams or have you found in other teams you've been in that there's, there's sort of a dominant coalition that, that forms and their way gets it? when perhaps, you know, other people may 
resist? Like the two positions? I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> so coalitions, coalition formation is a, is a very uh, powerful force in teams, and it can be a force for good or ill, right? Typically, though, the problem is is that we're, it's very hard for us to tell whether it's good or ill because if we're in the coalition, it's for good, and if we're not, it's for <laughs> ill, right? But what coalitions do is they tend to reduce the influence of the minority, and that can be very dangerous. Okay, so as long if we have a, a dominant coalition, we have enough people to sort of bull through and get it done, and the minority becomes, you know, so many chattering voices out there that we don't pay attention to. Sounds like the U.S. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Suppressing or avoiding conflict. You might, in fact, many teams find conflict a very scary experience. And so what happens is they tend to suppress differences rather than to engage the differences. And as a general rule, if your task is to learn, you have got to engage the differences. Because, yeah? The challenge with that often is you have small time periods to mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. And if you go with the conflict, you may never get to any resolution. Yep. That's the challenge you have. It is absolutely a challenge because one of the things that we're going to, you know, what happens is what you want to be able to do in a t- any kind of team interaction is engage the dispute, right? That is, begin to create dissonance, but you have to resolve it. You have to come, you have to now come to consensus, right? So you have this, first you have this sort of throwing the issue open and bringing it back down. The problem that you suggest is one of, that is very important. If you don't manage your team time and you end up with dissonance, 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 your team will will actually perceive that conflict, even though it might be um, conflict, which we, we term um, conflict of diverse of, of debate or controversy, good kind of conflict. If you can't resolve that, the team will reinterpret that as emotional or interpersonal conflict, and the team will begin to to, to dis, basically to dissociate, right? Just kind of it won't it won't function. And so part of it is, as a team lead, you've got to be really clear about that agenda. You know, one of the good things, by the way, they did many good things. One of the good things, and you can see on the tape, is they had a person who specifically watched the clock in this team in here. And many of you may have done that as well, right? To make sure you didn't get caught up in this kind of discussion and you didn't have time to come back and make sure you got to the end. And by the way, I want to just I want to congratulate all the teams for actually this was pretty punctual, given how these teams usually are. You did really good in getting the teams in here. Okay, <coughs> so let's break this down into three different problems. <coughs> Excuse me. Composition, participation, and influence. Now, I'm going to actually leap across composition because your teams are already formed. But what I've given you is some ideas about when and why you might want to use hom- more homogeneous versus more heterogeneous teams. It is not the case that always you want is you want maximum diversity. Nor is it the case that you always want maximum homogeneity, right? Typically the dis, the sort of the, the categorization is if implementation, homogeneity. If innovation, creativity, learning, heterogeneity in your teams. Why? Because we don't like to learn. We don't like to think. We only learn if there is motivation to do so. And that motivation typically comes in the form of, here's what I think the world is like, and my observations don't match that. So I've got to have some discrepancy. The way I create discrepancy in a team is to have people with different perspectives and views of the world. And then we work it out. right? So if I don't have that, if everybody has the same opinion, there's not going to be any learning. Because there's no impetus, no way to, no reason to force us to use those scarce resources. Okay, so that's we're going to sort of leap right across that. No, nope, that's more number nine. Here's some more of that. Here's more. I had a really nice set of slides, but <laughs> aha, the participation problem. Well. <clears throat> This is probably what you're going to find yourselves, now that you have your team formed, you're going to find yourselves having a real issue with participation. It's a very common team problem. And with participation, it is a learned behavior. Right? People, and so that's one of the reasons, sort of, and for those of you who had most of your team here, at this, and had this as your kind of quasi-first team meeting, 
turns out that this is actually a good thing because there was probably a lot of participation. And so you, in, you basically created a norm by your first team meeting that there's this kind of good-natured participation, right? Even if it was on something silly like desert survival. It's, whenever you are in a team, the first meeting is absolutely critical. It, is, it will set the stage for how the rest of the team's life goes. And so at, at that first team meeting, and a lot of, by the way, a lot of things that Cynthia said in her first session, I'm going to reiterate here, because she gave you a nice little set of to-dos about how to think about managing your team. But one of the things that's really important is don't underestimate that first team meeting to set the norms about communication and participation. It's a learned behavior. Even people who don't like to talk in public may find that in a team where the expectation is they contribute, they will. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I used to go to Thailand and teach for every year for a couple of months, or actually a couple of weeks. I lived in Chicago at the time. I was at Kellogg. And let me tell you, February in Chicago. And they said, hey, want to go to Bangkok? I went, pick me. Let me get out of here. Right? <laughs> so I would go there, and, and the first time I went, you know, and one of the things I do, you notice I don't actually speak from notes and stuff. It's what, you know, the notes, my notes are back there. You guys see them the same way I do. But if, if I can't get interaction, uh, this doesn't take very long, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I go to Thailand, and I have, I have a whole class I'm teaching, and I have my, you know, three note cards or three sets of overheads, right, that I put out there. And the first day of class, of a three-hour class, I finish in about... 45 minutes. I'm done. I've done everything I thought I, I had planned to do. There was not one comment, one question. There was not one engagement from the audience of 65 MBA students, okay? So I'm thinking to myself, oh, no. <laughs> this is going to be really bad. So I ended the class with, well, it's, you know, it's the first day. It's a short class, right? And I'm just, I'm because I'm in Thailand. It's not like I can bring more stuff, right? It's already, I'm already there, right? And so I'm thinking, oh, well, this is going to be, we're going to be finishing about, you know, one and a half classes will be done, right? <laughs> what do we do? And so as I close my books to get ready to leave, the line formed, right? And they started asking questions, completely reasonable questions. And I said, I said to the student, unfortunately, the poor guy who was the first one, I said, why didn't you ask this in class? And they said, Professor, we couldn't. And I went, why not? You know, I'm used to be, you know, think about Stanford. We can't ask questions. Yeah, right, all right. And they said, well, because, Professor, if we ask you a question in class, you would lose face because you actually hadn't answered, basically done a good job of explaining the material to us. Therefore, if we ask questions, we're calling in to, to question your, your capability, your professionalism, your expertise. And I said, that's real interesting because, you see, in my culture, when you don't ask a question, it says I haven't engaged you. And so I lose face if you don't ask questions. And they look at me and say, oh, this is hard. You know? <laughs> so, however, being, you know, you know, what is it, necessity is the mother of invention. I came into class the next class period with a bunch of red three by five cards. And I handed one out to each student in the class. And I said, in order to pass the class, you must turn in your need to speak card. That's what this is, the need to speak. Okay? If you do, and by the way, write your name on the card because I'm going to get and collect. And if by the end of the class you have not turned in this card, you have failed the class. <laughs> now, what is a need to speak card? A need to speak card is you can ask questions, you'll get it turned in, or you can say if you hold up your red card and there are other people talking, you get first call. I'll call you first. But at the end of the class, you need to turn in, the, you have got to have that card turned in. Well, it turns out that what I was doing was changing the nature, the structure of the class to force them at least to ask one question each, right? Knowing that if I opened the gates, right, if I got them to talk, they would talk more because then it was acceptable. And so part of this is understanding that you have to think about how do I structure the team meeting my team interaction such that people not only have permission, but feel the responsibility to talk, to contribute. Group size, <clears throat> sometimes we have large groups, and it turns out that group size is also problematic. If I have a group of 12, 
let me tell you, you can hide in there. You don't have to talk because there's enough people there, the airtime will be taken, and so you can spectate. If that's the case, if you find yourself in those kinds of situations, or even in a group of six sometimes people tend to hide, you might want to try what we call buzz groups. Because while you can hide with a group of six, you can't hide in a group of two, <laughs> right? So I say, okay, I want you two to talk about, we're going we're gonna to break down to sort of subgroups because this is an issue we have some disputes over. Let's talk about subgroups, and I want you to talk about this issue for five minutes. We're going to co come together as back to the larger group and figure out what the solution is going to be. Right. I'm forcing you now to communicate because if there's two of you, you can't not talk to the person sitting next to you that you've just did in the buzz group. Right. What we, use, what we were told to do in, as teachers is to recognize here, then go over here, then go over here, then go over here. Right. Completely blocking the natural tendency or if in this case, so they did that with room space, they also do it with gender or race. So if a woman speaks, now go to a man. If a man speaks, try to go to a woman. Well, what happens is you block because proximity and similarity tends to give people, increases the probability they'll talk, right? So you need to sort of understand these naturally occurring social factors that allow people to speak. Well, there's also the influence problem, right? Influence is why teams meet. You want to be able to be influenced and to influence other members of your team. I learn best when I get your ideas before they're influenced by mine. This is a problem though, right? How can everybody go first? Think about this. Have you ever done a brainstorming session? Tell me about, tell me the rules for brainstorming that you used. How did you? Huh? No judgment. No judgment. That's it. That's usually so. Any idea? No evaluation. Okay. Anything else? Anybody did? Everybody gets to write one down first. Huh? Everybody gets to write one. That's first. you see. This is the way to start a brainstorming session. If, as most people start brainstorming sessions, you just say, "Okay, let's all get together and throw up ideas and no evaluation." Okay. This is a bad way. Because as soon as the first idea is thrown up, it influences everybody else. And the point is, we, and the reason it's so powerful is because we don't think it does. We think we can sort of you know, be separate from. But in fact, we are dramatically influenced by that. And so as a result, what happens is that setting, being a first mover right, gets you to have much more influence in the group by your first idea statement or your willingness to sort of state a position early on than any of the subsequent contributions by other group members. In fact, I had a colleague of mine, a social psychologist, who knew this work and actually practiced it in faculty meetings. So when there was some place he wanted to go, he was, I mean, he didn't wait for, it was like, let me tell you what I think the right answer is, right? And dragged all of us there, right? Even though we may have disagreed, we now modulated our disagreement in his direction. And he knew it. He was great. <laughs> hey, if you know this stuff, use it, right? Well, there are two effects I want to talk about, and of influence. I want to talk about, yeah. I just have a question. Sure. Last point. So, if, if you if you are a, a leader of a group, mm -hmm. and you know that you're often vocal, but yes. you might be doing that to instigate mm -hmm. comments, and now from what you've said, there's a high likelihood that decision will go your way just because you spoke first. Yep. Is the influence the same if you point if, if somebody didn't do it of their own uh, volition but you said, okay, Fred, your idea, what is it? Does, does the it, tend to go that way as well if they speak? It does, yes. Because what happens is we don't remember why people spoke. Well, it's not that it's not that people spoke first because they're they are compassionate or I'm sorry, passionate about the idea. They spoke first. It's the speaking first. Right. And so part of what, I mean, and, and actually I was looking, I have a, a slide, that's what I was looking for, which basically gives you a whole list, not a whole list, a small group of, I have it in here someplace. There it is. Slide 29. We're just going to leap around here. Right? You want, you don't want to, you're the team lead. 
you think you may be giving your suggestions because you want to sort of provoke the group? Well, what happens when you do that is you influence the group. So you want to start with some, perhaps, with some writing, pre-writing. People sort of make a, they write about what they want to, their, their ideas are before they get influenced. In vertical groups, and this is a response to you, you want to actually have participation in verse relationship to the power of the group. So you want low, low power people, or low status people of the group to speak first, the high status of the leader to speak last. Because, you know, you, you've all been in teams in your organizations where as soon as the, 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 the leader speaks, the CEO speaks, we all say, sounds good to me. <laughs> Let's go. Right? But what that does is it destroy. Why then? Why are we? At, you know, why are we having this team? Why don't you send a memo out? This is what I want. You say, okay, fine, right? We don't need the team there. And you want to model and encourage dialogue over advocacy, right? Which is let's talk about why as opposed to I want I want to win. Right? Those are the two distinctions. So let's go back a little ways now. Oh, that was wrong. Let's try this again. 14. There. So there really are two things when you, what influence does is it changes people in two different ways or can change people's perceptions in two different ways or people's verbal or outward views of what, what their agreements are, what their opinions are. And it turns out we can have both an informational and a normative perspective. And the first one is that we often determine especially in ambiguous situations, what to do by looking around and saying, well, what's everybody else doing? Which is why the first meeting is so important. Because what we're doing here is, is a, teams are kind of an ambiguous situation. This is a, you know, a, a, an alumni consulting team. How, how do you behave in that team? Right? And so we look around to see what the norms are, what everybody else is doing. And secondly, it turns out... <coughs> When we don't, have, we don't know what the correct response is, we are dramatically influenced by our environment. The whole psychology of mobs right, is exactly this. We don't know what to do, we go with the mob. We look at, at what the rest of the, the large group of people are doing and we mirror that. Now here's my, one of my examples of informational proof. Um, the, uh, the woman at the staircase says, I don't buy stocks simply because others are buying them. I buy them because many others are buying them, <laughs> right? So I need lots of people to tell me this. But let me, so what happens is, in, we're in a situation where we don't know what the right answer is. We look around to try to find what that answer is. And what happens is that we get influenced and people will look to others but they look to it as information. Unfortunately, or fortunately, you decide which, what happens is we get anchored by it. It turns out that we look to it as we act as if we're going to have a little input into this. It'll be just like one component of the input. It has a huge impact. It has such a huge impact because we don't think it has an impact. Like a first offer in a negotiation. You'll probably, some of you know my teaching, wonder, was she going to get negotiation in here? Yes. Okay. A first <laughs> offer in a negotiation. We all know it's extreme, right? And we think we discount for the extremity of the first offer, but objectively, we don't discount enough. So what happens is we're still influenced in that direction, but even more so because we think, oh, we've already taken care of that, right? We've, ad we've adjusted for that. Well, what informational influence does is it changes our private view of the situation. So it's a private, we actually change how we think about things based upon what other people are doing. Let me give you an example. Informational conformity, bystander apathy. <laughs> this is a classic social psych experiment. What they do is they put two, three people in a room. You can sort of see the three, this is like a room with a chair, three chairs and a table. And here is the subject, the person who is actually the only naive person in the room. The other two people have scripts about how to behave. But the subject doesn't know that the other two are in cahoots. So what happens is they're in a room and they're asked to fill out a relatively extensive survey. And as they're filling out this form, you know, filling out the questions, suddenly from the closet, a huge billow of black smoke comes out of the uh, closet, under the door. <laughs> the subject looks up, and you can, they've got it videotaped, you can watch this, looks up, sees the smoke, looks around at the other two, 
They're calmly filling out the paper. And he goes back and calmly fills out his paper. Okay? You laugh. You have done it too. How many of you have fire drills in your buildings? And you say, well, it's just a drill. How do you know that? You know? My response is, if there's a fire drill, I'm walking out because I can't tell. And wouldn't I be irritated for eternity if it turned out to be real and I died? Okay? I mean, just... But what happens is, this person says, this is a weird situation. Okay, even better. Airplanes. You've been in an airplane, you've flown, and there's a big thunk. You look immediately to the flight attendants. Are they anxious? If they're not, uh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> Are you great? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We've all been there. And then I've already talked about anchoring. I haven't got enough time to talk about that, so you can read this yourselves. It was a very cute example. Here's some more. <clears throat> Hey, I got six minutes left, okay? Let me just tell you that if you haven't heard me talk about the anchoring and adjustment study on real estate, it's a good one. All right. <laughs> this, was, this was a really good leg. Okay, now, the normative basis for conformity. You know, they told me I only had two hours, and this is really a three-hour talk, so what can I say? You know? And I did want you to not get it so you can read about it. The normative basis is actually as powerful as the infor informative basis of conformity. The normative basis says, I want to be a good team player. I want to be part of the group. This is why there's such a notion of conformity, right? Because we believe that what a good team is is a team that is without conflict, that is, that is basically got a lot of agreement. Also, others who may want to who have a particular goal in mind or who want to get out of the meeting, right? Provide rewards and punishments to us. And we want to see, we want to get those rewards and avoid those punishments. So we oftentimes accommodate the majority. Now, interestingly, when informational conformity changes my private opinion, here you get public compliance, but not necessarily internal change. So I may say yes, but I don't really mean it but I'm doing it as an expediency. And for those of you who haven't ever seen, this is the ASH experiments. These were, actually the, these were the original guys in the ASH experiment. Uh, subject number six is the only subject. The other six people are Confederates. And they're, what they're looking at <clears throat> is this example. And they're basically asked, which line is close, which of line, A, B, or C, is closest in length of the standard, right? And the answer, of course, is C. All of you knew it. How surprisingly. Okay. It's not a hard thing. What happened was in the ASH experiments is the six other Confederates were told, answer B. Okay? So this is what's happening. He's hearing B, B, and he's looking. He's going, wait, what's the, I mean, it's like, What's wrong? It's C, he's thinking to himself. It's got to be C, right? And, and, and 35 to 40% of the subject sixes, when asked, What's the, which line is it, says C, knowing that it's B. But they look around, say B, knowing that it's C, right. You got, thank you. I'm glad you were listening. That was a test. Okay, so part of it is that they accommodated, right? They gave a public compliance, but clearly they knew that it was not B, it was C. And it, by the way, it turns, you can get even more compliance if there's some connection between the individual and the other six people. For example, uh, they did this with a group of high school students, and they put wrestling team members. And it went with their wrestling team the other five, six members of the, of the group of wrestling team members who said, B, you had a much higher percentage of the other wrestling team member, the subject, saying B, right? Group connectedness, group compliance. You saw that one already? <clears throat> so here's some to-dos or some suggestions for you in getting your voice heard. First, here's the first one. You need to express yourself. If you disagree with your team, if you believe that where the team is going is not the right place, you need to talk about it. You need to, to take the responsibility to put that information out there for the team, maybe even multiple times. 
right? Because what's going to happen is the team is going to want to engulf you, to say, you know, we really, really can accommodate your concerns. Just come along with us, right? It's the amoeba response, right? Let me just engulf you so that you know you're, go you're going to be one of us. Don't worry about it, right? You need to be able to present solid justifications for why you disagree and you also need to differentiate your perspective. So I need to get you, the majority, to tell me why my, my concerns aren't critical, right? You have to convince me, as I need to convince you that they are very different and my, my perspective is very different. So I have, to, I have to sharpen the distinction between you and me, between the minority and the majority, because the minority and majority, the majority wants conformity. That's one of the real goals of a major, majority is to get everybody to agree. Now, it's really interesting. Uh, uh, Deborah Grunfeld, you may know if you've actually been here for a short period of time, but if you haven't, is a, is a faculty member here at Stanford, and she does a lot of work on power. And she, as her dissertation, did an, a really cool study. And what she did was she went, she got the, the uh, decisions of, of the Supreme Court and categorized them whether they were unanimous decisions or majority-minority decisions. And then she evaluated what they call the integrative, what she called the integrative complexity of the decision. That is, how logically argued and complete were the decisions. And then she looked at whether those that were more logically argued and more complete were as a result of unanimous or as a result of a majority minority. And it turns out very clearly, if you look at these two different types of decisions by the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter how many years you go back, right? You just, I mean, so whether they're Republican or Democratic courts, doesn't really matter, right? But you go back, you find that the more integratedly complex decisions came when there was a majority and a minority. Because the minority, while they may not have been accepted, had to be considered. And in doing so, the logic and the complexity of the arguments were much higher. Okay, so the decisions were better because there was a minority, even if the minority's opinion did not hold. And what happens? If you are a minority opinion holder, it depends how you, how you convey that differs whether your group is typically homogeneous or typically heterogeneous. If your team is typically homogeneous, that is, for example, and you, can, you might be able to do this depending on how you characterize it. Here you are, you're in an ACT team, and you're all from Stanford, okay? So if you want to you play that, it, the team is primarily homogeneous, you say, you know what, we're all... We're all from the same background. We're all together. I'm, all, I'm one of you guys, and I disagree. You basically call the commonality and then say what you disagree about. What you don't want to be in a homogeneous team is what we call a double minority. That is, you disagree and there's something weird about you. <laughs> okay? That's a bad place because your team will reject you for that. Right? Oh yeah, there he is. There he goes again. He always does that because he's, you know, he made your, he, he made your, because he's in marketing and they're weird. Okay. <laughs> if you are, for example, the only marketing person in a group of finance majors, so maybe that's how your team has talked about itself, you want to highlight your difference because everybody knows you're not a finance person. Okay, you're a marketing person. Why do we have a marketing person? There must be a reason for that, right? There's a reason for your difference. So what you do then in those situations is you highlight your difference. You actually want to be a double minority. You highlight your difference. Here's why I was brought on board. I was brought on board because of my different perspective. And now let me tell you why I disagree. And it turns out that teams actually are more influenced, if you compare how influenceable teams are, by a minority member a di uh, who comes from a, who is a du well, in this case a double minority in a in a heterogeneous group than a double minority in a homogeneous group. Although you expect that if we're all together and all alike, I'd be more influential. Turns out it's not true, because because we're so alike, we really resist conflict and dealing with differences. We suppress them much more so than if there's some obvious heterogeneity in the group. Find an ally among the incumbents, right? 
This is a really good solution. By the way, this is a really good solution, especially, for example, if you're a new member. Right? If you're a new member, you are going to be more effective if you've got some, if you can basically find some way to ally with one of the old timers, the incumbents. And by the way, this research has been supported in um, corporate boards of directors, where it turns out that if you're sort of a minority member on the board, you're much more effective if, one, you've been a minority member on other boards, or if other board members have been minority members on the boards they've been on. It makes you much more effective. And so making those connections can enhance your effectiveness. Consider your motives and choose your fights. <clears throat> if you are that type of person who always likes to be that contrarian, this is a dangerous position because your group will eventually ostracize you. And they may let you still sit in the room, but they won't pay any attention to you. <laughs> right? As a team lead, if you got somebody like that in your group, you need to assign roles. And you need to say, you know what, Vivian, today you are the contrarian. Cynthia, you're not. What you're going to do today <laughs> is you're going to be, basically, you're going to manage, you're going to facilitate the discussion. That's your job, right? So what you've got to do is, because otherwise, every time Cynthia, if Cynthia's the contrarian, every time she speaks, the group kind of just goes, their eyes glaze over. You know, it's like, there she goes again. <laughs> All right, wrap up. Being a good team member or a good team leader requires three characteristics. Preparation. Teams don't function without some hard thought and consideration about how to do well. What are we trying to accomplish? How can we get there? You need to actually think about it. We, we, are, we are in social groups all, all our lives, but that doesn't mean we know how to run a team. You've got to think about this stuff. Secondly, connectedness. Teams create, the team becomes an entity. We are connected. One of the things that used to amaze people, and it certainly amazed me when I first found out about it and sort of observed it, in my, one of my past lives, I used to be a, a marriage counselor and family therapist. And families would come to, you know, see us, and they would say, you know what, Ron is the problem. <laughs> Our son Ron is the problem. <laughs> Fix him, will you? <laughs> and you know what, if something happened and Ron was like, went away to boarding school, or went away to jail, or went away, then what would happen is they'd say, you know what? It's our daughter Cynthia now. She's the problem. <laughs> because it wasn't Ron or Cynthia or any of the other siblings, right? It was the family system that had a problem. And so if you have a contrarian in your group and you ostracize that person, there will be another one that arises in your group to take that role because the group needs it. There's something happening in the group you need to consider. So you need to think about the interconnectedness and not say, if we could just get rid of X, our lives would be wonderful because they won't be because Y will show up and behave in and surprisingly the same way. You need to deal with the problems, not think that they'll just go away through attrition. And finally, you need to develop discipline and emotional maturity. One of the things that we know is that teams don't like conflict. Team members don't like conflict. So we try to suppress, ignore, you know, reorient, Anything, just so we don't have to deal with conflict. Conflict is absolutely critical for people to learn. And so part of what you guys are going to be doing is engaging in these kinds of learning activities. You need to encourage conflict. People need to be willing to, to basically ask the hard questions and engage in emotionally uncomfortable situations for the good of the team, if you care about the team. And that's part of what you need to think about, getting the team members willing to, to have enough commitment to the team that they're willing to engage in these tough discussions. Chopri. Uh, could you uh, tell us a little more about structures? What structures are you talking about? Structures mean such, I mean, part of the structure I gave was, I, I sort of talked a lot about structure. So how does the first meeting work? You want to structure the first meeting, right? So you may also, in, in terms of structuring, uh, you may want to think about how, what other issues you need to address in that first meeting. This is not on my slides. Let me give you another point that you need to think about. Let's have a, in our first meeting, we need to have a time when we talk about what are the goals and missions of this team. 
What are we trying to accomplish? Because one of the most critical aspects of team performance is commonality of goal and mission among the team members. So I would strongly encourage you to start a meeting with, these kind, with this kind of discussion so that you get some commonality and commitment to those goals and missions. That will, be, that will push you a long way. The t a team that believes that, that members have common goals and missions can handle a lot more conflict successfully than teams that are wondering, why are you really here? All right, so that's a real important point. Setting, assigning roles is another form of structure. Right? So if you find people to naturally take on certain roles, you know, it, Cynthia said work to your strengths, absolutely, but you've got to watch out that some of these people, some people may see their strength being the contrarian. That's not a good role for someone to take. Okay? Assign that role. Basically get people involved so that, so when people do make these um, um, co contrarian statements, it's not seen as a personal attribute. Okay? So those are some examples. All right. I'm now nine minutes over. Yes. Again, I have a question. Go ahead. <coughs> so if you assign the role of contrarian, does that mean that other people would feel more limited in their ability to express a contrary view? Um, probably not, but they could be. I mean, people. I mean, what would happen is it takes the pressure off people to be contrarians, right? Mm -hmm. So I might say, okay, well, okay, it's best turn to be a contrarian. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I mean. So it can't be Beth. We got to put somebody else. So we're going to let Tony be the contrarian now because you've been a contrarian too much. But what it means is that it might dampen your natural predilection to do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, but it might also open up. You might get a little more other people being willing to speak because they can't. That they. Tony may not be as good at it as you are. But do you think others in the group might even um, enforce that a little bit? Like, yes, know, they Tony's might. Tony's the contrarian. Yeah, Beth? <laughs> yes, they might, but that might be good for you, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it may not be fun. It's so much more fun to say, uh-uh. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.